Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, the Torpe the Great Torpedo Factory. Uh, it, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our special guest speaker, Richard Orland, uh, this evening. And I want to, you know, just before I do that, just uh, thank, on behalf of the Art League, uh, everybody here for uh, making such a fantastic show. Uh, because uh, just seeing this uh, great sea of people you can see the intensity and devotion to uh, not only the great master, uh, John Singer Sargent, but also to those fantastic books uh, that, uh, that Richard Ormond has uh, produced. And Richard Ormond, he has a, you know, there's a, a, a tremendous career in, uh, in the arts, uh, which has involved posts uh, as uh, deputy director at the Portrait Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery in London, and uh, the, uh, at the Maritime Museum, he was the uh, director there as well. Uh, but he's best known uh, for his uh, uh, scholarship on uh, Sir John Singer Sargent. Uh, he has written over 30 volumes on uh, you know, great art, artists, British and American, uh, from Landseer to Lord Leighton, uh, but John Singer Sargent, I think, is his specialty. And uh, so he's one of the world's foremost scholars on Sargent. But unlike the other um, historians who are all fantastic, he's got a very distinctive perspective on Sargent because he has a unique connection to, to that great American master. He's his grandnephew. Uh, so Violet, his grandmother, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, Sargent's little sister and the subject of many of his so, uh, and, and the subject of his talk, I think, will touch upon that special connection that, that he's had. And uh, um, so, it, it we'll be diving in very thoroughly and, uh, and, and uh, you know, here at uh, the Torpedo Factory, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, just a tremendous enthusiasm for uh, Sargent. And uh, um, so, excuse me here for a second, just, uh, um, I, the, you know, we have that uh, tremendous appetite for that uh, master, and um, uh, and I would consider this area right here, uh, the Torpedo Factory, uh, the Art League specifically, the epicenter of Sergeant Enthusiasm. Um, we <laughs> need long, long and, the, and the school has organized, uh, we were talking about this earlier, numerous trips to some of the great cities to study the greatest art, uh, you know, we've been to Rome and Madrid and, uh, and, and you know, in Paris and Venice, all, and he studied Michelangelo and Ang and all these fantastic artists. But in every place, Sargent uh, always comes up. We always find a connection to Sargent in each of these grand cities. And when we visited London, Megwin, she was right here. She's right there. Uh, she, she's our. Uh, the Art League Torpedo Factory ambassador to the world. Uh, so she had um, had the inspiration to contact Richard Orland. And, uh, and so we did. And, um, and uh, though we weren't able to meet him, he did orchestrate a visit to Sargent's Tight Street Studio, the famed studio that, right in London. And it was one of the most memorable events of any of these uh, incredible trips. And I should thank Margaret Cerruti also for uh, not only for organizing uh, those uh, amazing trips, but uh, but uh, also for so boldly approaching <laughs> Mr. Ormond in Atlanta and uh, extending an invitation for him to come here and visit with us tonight. And so I get to sit next to him this evening. And uh, now I like everybody here to welcome Richard Ormond. Thank you, Robert, for that um, very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, artists are always amongst the greatest of Sargent's fans. You really get it. And um, I always feel entirely at home when I'm surrounded, as I am here, uh, by artists. Um, uh, my uh, talk tonight is um, uh, a bit um, harem scarum. I'm not following a really awfully coherent theme. You always have to forgive me. Uh, I'm here, there, and everywhere. 
I'm going to start with the commercial. Um, this is, um, these are the um, uh, seven, actually there are eight published volumes, and volume nine is on the way. So it's going to come out um, next year. Um, and uh, then, supposedly, the whole business is over, all the oils and watercolors will have been done, uh, but actually I'm starting on a new project because I can't stop, so I'm going to be doing the charcoal portraits, what Sergeant called mug shots, uh, of which have about 600, so uh, I've got a bit of, um, uh, I've got another task uh, mapped out ahead. Uh, uh, and just to, to remind you, some of you may have seen this exhibition, uh, which I was the curator of, uh, 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 which was recently closed at the Metropolitan Museum, that showed a particular aspect of Sargent, his relationship with other artists, writers, musicians, actors. And it was to present a rather different view of him from the Grand Society portrait painter, with which we're very familiar. This was him in his relationship to the arts. And um, I think people really got the point of the exhibition. Um, um, just to start off with a little bit of background, um, Sargent was born in Florence uh, in 1856 to expatriate American parents. Um, uh, it was said that um, the Sargents came to Europe to get over the the birth of their, the death of their firstborn, a sort of um, reconciliation journey, and they forgot to go home. And um, so they lived a kind of ex rather gypsy-like expatriate existence, uh, wandering around. You spent the, uh, the winter in the south, Rome, um, Nice, somewhere like that, and then you came up uh, with the seasons, and then you uh, went to the Alps or the Pyrenees in the hot months, and then visited Paris, etc., and then he went south again. Um, and Dr. Sargent, on the left here, had been a very promising doctor at Will's Hospital in Philadelphia, and really he sacrificed his career, his family, on the altar of his wife's passion for Europe. And uh, so Sargent had rather little schooling, but he was brought up um, knowing all the great cities of Europe, all the great works of art. Um, so a very cosmopolitan upbringing, not a very formal education. Um, and his father was really um, the chief tutor to his children. And here you see the young sergeant with a hoop, and here sergeant with his sister, Emily. And Emily was a rather special person. She had a deformed back and she was rather the sacrificial daughter, you know, retained to look after mum. And uh, she was very talented as a watercolor. She was musical, highly intelligent. And she and Sergeant drawn together in this rather strange existence um, uh, were very close to each other. Somebody, a biographer, described Emily as the, uh, the wife um, whom Sergeant never had. Um, and she really acted as his um, hostess very often. Uh, they were very, very close. Um, and um, you see her here in a lovely portrait, sensitive portrait by Sargent of the 1870s when she's 18. And um, she was also his invariable traveling companion in later years. And you can see her with their friend, em uh, Eliza Wedgwood, uh, Emily in black with a, a brush clasping her teeth. Uh, they're in Mallorca. And um, uh, Emily always in black. Uh, and uh, this is one of those lovely, gorgeous watercolors with, uh, um, where it's about the play of light on these figures and the light coming through the uh, painting umbrella, which is there to protect Emily from the direct glare of the sun. Um, and uh, here are a couple of Emily's watercolors. She really deserves to get some credit for her work, and I hope sometime there's a little Emily exhibition uh, because she's uh, otherwise in the shadow of her brother. This is a scene in Italy, and that, of course, is a famous Venetian icon. It's the um, 
to Ghana at the end of the Grand Canal with the Statue of Fortune on top. So Emily is uh, gifted in her own right. And then this is Violet, who was 14 years younger, the baby of the family. Uh, and uh, this is my grandmother, uh, painted often in the 1880s as here in a ravishing picture called The Morning Walk, 1888, she would have been 18, uh, walking beside the Thames at Colcott, recalling those Monet-esque um, girls with umbrellas you probably remember. So this is a period when Sargent's very much under the influence of, of Monet. Um, and the photograph of her uh, of about the same period. Um, she married a well, might, the next slide might, um, she was very beautiful. Um, uh, yes, there she, uh, that's her husband, um, uh, Francis Ormond, who was Swiss, um, a total tear away. He ran away to Canada at the age of 15, had to be rescued by Pinkerton. Um, <laughs> never, uh, the family were in tobacco, you could still buy Bowman cigars in Switzerland, um, but he never went into the family business. Um, one of his sons was quite back to run the business. Um, Francis was a terrific traveler. They were always in North Africa, their houses in Tunisia. Uh, he loved the, um, uh, uh, the Arabs. He was very close to, uh, to um, local inhabitants in Tunisia and other parts of North Africa. Uh, he a trip to Tahiti, um, uh, which was supposed to be three months, and he didn't come back for three years. <laughs> and everybody, I think Sergeant included, said my grandmother should divorce him, but he deserted her. But he came back, and they continued as if nothing had happened. So, and that's my grandmother, as I remember her, with my little sister. Um, she was quite a formidable figure, and I being a uh, not an entirely well-behaved little boy, I was always terrified that I would block my copybook, which I'm sure I did. Uh, and she lived in a flat in, um, in uh, Cheney, Cheney Walk um, in her later years when she was widowed, which was covered from floor to ceiling with Sargent's pictures. And I have one picture always um, stuck up that I absolutely loved of a Javanese dancing girl, which was on the turn of the corridor where it went right, right angles and I just absolutely used to be mesmerized by this um, painting. Uh, oh yes, and this is a, a, a picture, a family picture of my father and his sister, Wren, who was also much painted by Sargent in later years. Um, People used to think when I was a little boy that it was a picture of me because I looked just like my father when I was small. Anyway, this is 1906, given to Violet as a Christmas present. So it's a very special picture. Of course, my father remembered that he was very restless and um, it, it kept moving around. Whereas, of course, Wren, being a little girl, knows just what's what. And she was, um, she's very good at posing, unlike my father. Um, just to go back a bit in time, um, uh, in uh, going around Europe, uh, Mrs. Sargent uh, always uh, would sketch. That was part of what you did when you were uh, touring around Europe. She said she was never happier than when she was in a hotel bus, either going to the station or coming from the station. But uh, she encouraged her children to sketch like she did, and um, she always said that whatever they started, they must finish the sketch. So Sergeant, right from the beginning, is sketching in watercolour, and he takes to it very quickly. Uh, these, this is a, a, a picture of watercolour of the Shrek Hall in the Swiss Alps, uh, painted when he was 14. So, um, uh, and it shows that kind of clarity of observation um, even at this very young age, that ability to seize um, uh, the scene and put it down um, with great um, immediacy. Uh, I mean, it's more detail than he would become 
later. I mean, it's more sort of true to nature, Ruskinian, but it still demonstrates his ability to transform what he sees into terms of um, the painted surface. Um, and he goes, in 1874, um, his parents realize somewhat reluctantly that they have a son whose one object in life is to become an artist. And um, they sort of realize that they can't stop him. So they think, well, he better get trained. And where's the best get, place to get trained in 1874? It's Paris. So they come to Paris and they enter in the studio of Carlos Durand, fashionable French portrait painter, but he's also a friend of Manet. And in many of, one feels often that the, um, the, the, the kind of modern-day dialogue, modern -day dialogue you know, that it has to be either you're an academic or you're an impressionist. The, the French art scene is much more complicated and there are far more crossovers than we like to imagine. So anyway, Carlos Diona teaches his pupils to paint from the very word go, usually in ateliers at that time, very academic, you started drawing from the cast, then you would begin to draw from life, and only then would you be allowed near a paintbrush. Carlos Bjorn got his pupils painting from the word go, and painting al primo, au premier point point, in the French word, each stroke of the brush should describe a tone or a half tone. And this method of painting, which of course creates an intense kind of realism. Um, Sargent just um, took to like a duck to water, and um, he becomes a kind of star pupil. Um, he's also doing the academic thing because he studies drawing at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, so he's not ignoring that side of art. Um, and of course, later on, when he's doing his murals, he thinks that public art is the highest kind of art to which a, a, a painter can aspire. Uh, and here, a lovely sketch of two fellow artists, uh, young men, Paul Elieu behind with a lifelong friend of Francois Flamand. Um, just again in, in the studio, he's um, uh, doing the more formal things. And this portrait on the left was um, exhibited at the Salon and inscribed to Carlos Durand, a kind of rite of passage, Sergeant acknowledging his debt to his master and taking leave of him. Uh, and it's a wonderful picture. Uh, it's like the off center, he's very flamboyant, sense all that, the dandified, um, uh, elegant master. And it's so alive, that slightly sinister face with all that dark beard. Um, but it's a marvelous uh, picture of this um, uh, teacher and uh, mentor. And then very early on, Sergeant, making his mark at the Salon um, in portraits like the two on the screen. Well, in fact, the one of Dr. Potsy wasn't. It was sent to the Royal Academy and also to an exhibition in, in, um, in uh, Belgium and later in Brussels, Les Ex, a sort of avant-garde exhibition. But Madame Pyron was um, 1880, uh, Sergeant's 26, no, less, 24, and um, painting her in her Savoy um, country house, uh, and she's the wife of a very popular um, playwright and the daughter of uh, Edmund Boulot, who is the editor of the Revue du Le Monde. So Sargent's moving in to literary uh, circles. He's, he's becoming part of the Paris cultural scene, if you like. Uh, of course, Dr. Ponzi is the picture everybody died for, and all the girls loved it in the exhibition. I mean, he's very dishy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, 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 he was actually uh, a major pioneer of gynecology and women's diseases, but I don't think he's portrayed here as a great doctor, but more as a wonderful kind of aesthetic personality. Uh, he was a friend of Montesquieu's, very much part of the French aesthetic um, movement, friend of Montesquieu, who's kind of um, the high priest of French aestheticism, uh, friend of Proust, 
uh, etc. Um, and uh, um, uh, of course, Sargent's doing a sort of Velasquez of Van Dyke, if you like, but in a rather subversive way, because instead of being dressed up in his finery, he's in his dressing gown, um, in his slippers, um, but it's a marvelous um, tour de force, all red on red. And this was another of the star pictures. This was the Pyron children. Um, Marie Louise, uh, she describes it in a charming memoir called The Paradis Perdu, The Lost Paradise. Um, these, uh, with her brother, whom she barely mentions in her memoir. I didn't think she got on it. Well. <laughs> anyway, this in, and she describes how many cities, how badly behaved she was, um, how she growled with Sargent. And um, you get something of that, but it's a very strange, eerie picture. Um, people have compared it to the turn of the screw. You know, this <laughs> in white, scaring the head. Um, and uh, the whole scene on that banquette with the, the carpet going up over the banquette, uh, it's a very strange, eerie, but powerful picture. And this was 1881. But he's also doing um, not just he's not just making his mark with portraits, but also with large-scale figure compositions. And this was one of his earliest, En route pour la pêche. It's all the women of Concal on the Brittany coast going down to tend the oyster beds. Uh, you brought the oysters in, and then you put them into beds in order that you could grow them to the right size. And so it's a tremendous, very labor intensive. And he paints this ravishing scene um, of this uh, uh, procession, which is a very carefully judged kind of processional picture. I mean, he studied uh, studies for each of the fig figures. It's very, and then set them against this ravishing sort of Buddha-like or Monet-like um, uh, beach scene stretching away. And this wonderful way he handles the reflected light in these foreground um, pools of water. Um, and uh, he made quite a mark. This is 1878, a bit earlier than the portraits I've been showing. And was the, um, uh, the centerpiece of an exhibition that was held here in um, 2007 of Sergeant in the Sea at the Corcoran. Now sadly gone. Uh, and Sargent mixes with um, the French art world. Here's uh, a very powerful picture of the young Auguste Rodin, who's a lifelong friend. Um, and Sargent is, uh, is a, a, a deep admirer of Rodin. And by the same token, he helps Rodin to get commissions, introduces him to English patrons. When Rodin comes to London, he stays with Sargent. This is late, much later. This is 1884. Um, uh, and then on the left, he's also into music. Sargent's deeply musical. Um, he could play the piano. People say he could have been a concert pianist. And this is a portrait of his friend, Gabriel Foy, who's quite controversial as a composer. Um, uh, his melodies and are thought to be way out. Um, and Sargent's a fervent admirer of Foray. And again, somebody described him as, as in London as Foray's chief champion. Um, and of course, Claude Monet. Um, and this is a wonderful picture of Claude. Sargent doing a Monet of Monet um, <laughs> painting. And um, uh, it's uh, the picture that's on the, the easel. It's actually known. It's in the mu it's in the uh, um, uh, museum uh, of uh, fine arts in Boston. And Monet and Sargent, again, Sargent is the admiring younger man, he's deeply um, uh, devoted to Monet, uh, and again helps to find Monet um, uh, to help him to find patrons. And the correspondence, Sargent's letters to Monet, have recently emerged, and they show how close the two men were um, throughout their lives, really. Uh, and when Monet, Sargent helps Monet to get um, a London exhibition together, 
um, and uh, helps him in all sorts of ways. Uh, and the two of them, uh, I mean, the, the sergeant's supreme hero really is Edward Manet, the, the great outsider, the man who goes on and on exhibiting at the salon, these large scale, keeps being um, battered by the critics and just keeps going. He's the great hero to many of the younger generation. And Sergeant and Monet formed the campaign to buy Manet's Olympia, the naughty, the, the um, prostitute lady on the bed, that wonderful painting for the Louvre. And of course, the Louvre say, well, oh my God, Manet, no, no, you can't have such a, you know, a, a rebel and uh, all the rest of it. But eventually, they win the day, and that's why the, that great painting is in, in the French National Collection. Um, um, and um, another absolute um, picture that sort of wowed the critics was this great flamenco picture in the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum. It's about 18 feet across. It's a flamenco dancer, and it just stunned everybody. I mean, some of the critics complained about it being unfinished, and it is true that it's like a jumbo sketch, and, and it gets wilder and wilder as you go towards the right. Um, and, uh, but it's a sort of scene, as it were, but it's very much, as it were, of a Spanish cafe where dancers would perform. But it's highly stylized. Sergeant's taken it from Spain into a sophisticated um, Parisian, turned it into a sophisticated Parisian picture, but it's still absolutely wonderful. And then this picture was in 1882, people were talking about Sargent as the heir to Manet. Um, and uh, another, but quite different, the, the Pavelu Orchestra. This is Sargent, uh, this is him in grand style. He loved Spanish music. He used to um, play Spanish records to keep his sitters lively in the studio. Sergeant wasn't a great, didn't have a lot of conversation, so to keep people um, uh, feed up, he played in Spanish music. Uh, and this is the Padalu Orchestra, which is so avant-garde. You're looking down on the pit at this circus it, 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 of a rehearsal. And uh, I just love the way the sheet music, it's almost like a, a musical score you know, the, um, the white and the black musicians. And in, it's a full orchestra. I like to think they're playing Wagner, but somebody said, oh, no, no, they're playing Berlioz. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, it's like a Degas. And he's, what he's done with the perspective is anybody's business. And you, he's got some clowns in the foreground just to remind you that you're in the Sac d'Hiver, which is a wonderful round um, Second Empire building. It's still there. And it's still a circus. And here's the young sergeant, uh, sort of um, 1884, you know, at the height of his Parisian period. He's bought his own house. He's flying high. And um, you can see him surrounded with the last copies of Franz House and Velasquez. Those were the two great heroes for sergeant, as for so many of those people. Velasquez, the kind of proto realist. Um, and Franz Hals, the master of the brush, brushwork. So they beat a part to the Prado. Sergeant did a dozen copies after the last quiz, and they beat a part to um, Harlem, to the almshouses, to those great group pictures. Uh, and top right above Sergeant himself was one of the Franz Hals, a fragment from one of those great groups. Um, the last quiz are up here. And that charming little picture is my grandmother called the breakfast table. It's now in the fog art gallery of her <laughs> cutting up an apple. Um, and then, wow, uh, it all went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and this lady was the cause of his downfall. Amelie Gautreau from Louisiana, originally married to a French banker. Sergeant was riveted by her profile and by her whole persona. She was quite notorious in French society, a sort of reigning beauty, but um, also um, uh, 
created scandals with her bizarre behavior. Um, and, but, and Sargent planned this. He didn't, it wasn't the commission. It was he who asked the painter. And it was to be a chef d'oeuvre. He was going to really establish him in France. And it just got howled down for reasons difficult to understand today, because she seems the height of elegance and sophistication. Admittedly, she's rather <coughs> daringly dressed. And she had this white skin. She used rice powder to create this very white skin. And that sort of outturned arm, uh, very sinuous. She is provocative. And this, uh, we all know the strap was off the shoulder originally. And so anyway, the French just thought this was a step too far. It was a disaster. And um, Sergeant took it hard because, of course, the commissions dried up. He was a marked man. Nobody was getting sick to him. And he talked about giving up art and turning to business. Um, and at this um, unhappy period in his life, um, he was rescued by a group of artists and writers who formed a colony in Broadway in the English Cotswolds, where they all painted and wrote in the summer, including um, Edwin Austin Abbey, top left, Edmund Goss, the English writer, Henry James, the novelist, and Lily Millett, uh, Frank Millett's wife, and she was the life and soul of the party. Um, she was the, um, a very vital, lively person. And we are now sort of 1885, 6, and Sargent, this really restores his morale. And because he's not been given any portraits, he comes back to landscape and he's painting in a Monet-esque and an Impressionist idiom. Um, and his great masterpiece of these years is Carnation Lily Lily Rose. Um, and um, the ultimate garden picture, very difficult to paint gardens, and this is about as close as you get, these two little girls in white against lilies, a uh, sort of tapestry, dense tapestry of flowers. It's very claustrophobic, there's very little recession. He's painting in the twilight hour, which is very difficult, the light effects. He had to, um, uh, he, he all painted out of doors. It was all done from life. And uh, he had sort of 20 minutes a day when, you know, they, they put the tennis rackets away. The picture would be wheeled out. The little girls would be put into white. And there he paint away during that time. And it's very free. It's like a huge impressionist thing. I mean, it's very loose. But it won the hearts of the British public for the first time. Of course, the English are sentimental. They love little girls in white. The little <laughs> girls were daughters, Barnards, daughters of um, an English uh, illustrator. And I just interject a little personal. Um, the little girl on the right um, was my brother's godmother. And I can just remember her as an old lady in, still in Broadway, still lived in Broadway, um, quizzical, bright-eyed, um, and uh, uh, the Barnards were very, very close. Sergeant, sort of, the, I'm afraid the father took to drink, and um, uh, Sergeant sort of looked after them, and they travelled with him in later years. They were very, very close to the family. And he's also painting pictures like this, Paul Ellu, who you saw earlier, the French artist, um, sitting with his bored wife. Um, and it's such a dazzling. Um, uh, people often ask me, it was such an impression. Well, if you look at the way he's, uh, the highly key palette, the, the perspective, I mean, that looks as if the bank is rising vertically. Um, and, um, uh, but, no, Monet would never have painted a figure with such, you feel um, the energy of Elio as he putting the brush down. It's so, uh, Sargent had a, had a weakness for people who were the antithesis of himself. Um, the outgoing, um, extrovert, uh, flamboyant Elio, um, lean, lithe, uh, quite unlike the um, tongue-tied, inhibited, reserved, portly sergeant. 
Um, so often these um, uh, unlikely um, uh, uh, friendships um, of quite different um, personalities and types uh, really works. And then he uses also the um, right across the composition, like a sort of is that those of you who are Bojian people will know that it's a, 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 a Canadian canoe. Um, <laughs> but anyway, a red Canadian canoe um, is um, the thing that shoots across. I'm sure I'm going on for much too long. Um, uh, he's also um, painting um, some delicious interiors at this time. So he's out of doors, but he's also painting atmospheric and um, this is a picture of the Vickers family. The Vickers were great um, uh, armaments people. Uh, this was painted in their country house. And um, uh, you, we're looking across. We're also at the table. In fact, we're seated about here. And Sergeant just chops Mr. Vickers in half. <laughs> um, uh, and um, quite deliberately, elements on the table, glistening in the in the lamplight, and it's such an evocative picture. We're looking, sort of, she's turned to talk to us, um, Mrs. Vickers, uh, in this intimate um, uh, uh, interior. Did uh, several of these, and this extraordinary picture, which was one of the highlights of the recent Sargent exhibition, Robert Louis Stevenson walking in his drawing room uh, in Bournemouth. But what on earth is he doing? He's um, walking up and down. His wife is slumped in a sort of Indian um, sari in the right-hand corner. And um, the doorway is opening to some inner world um, which we just glimpse. And Stevenson is striding across the room. He said about it that um, it, um, that it was uh, really a caricature, um, a brilliant caricature, and damned queer as a whole, he says. Um, and you can see what it means. What, there's a story here, but what's going on? But Mr. Sargent leaves it to you to interpret this scene as you will. Somebody said about it, you don't need to know anything about Stevenson the great writer, it's all here. Yeah. And you do get a vivid sense of Stevenson's enormous charisma, vitality. He's another one of these long, lean, extrovert characters whom Sargent loved to portray. But it's an absolutely scintillating picture and shows here with his friends that Sargent can break out of all the normal conventions to create something really memorable and unusual. Um, uh, his breakthrough as a portraitist comes not in England, but in America. Uh, in 1887, Mr. Marquand, Sergeant's now 30, Mr. Marquand, um, a banker, New York banker, chairman of the Metropolitan Museum of Trustees, says, will you come and paint my wife? Sergeant doesn't want to go, so he quotes an enormous price for this picture, which is immediately accepted. And <laughs> Sergeant comes to America, he has exhibited, he's, I think, aware that America's going to be very important to him from a patronage point of view. He comes to America and he's mobbed. Everybody wants to be painted by Mr. Sergeant, the returning prodigal son, who exemplifies high French style. And that's what they want. And um, so, and he comes back in 1890 for a second visit, paints more than 40 portraits, is commissioned by the Boston Public Library, McKim, Mead, and White's Beaux Arts building, just recently built, to decorate it with a series of murals. And so, this is um, really here in America that he, he, he makes his mark. And these are two portraits done in America. Edwin Booth, the great actor uh, here, uh, he's not in character, but he's definitely on the stage. And you feel with this rather sinister background, this huge great um, fireplace with the gridirons and the fire in the background, this complex, brilliant actor 
um, of course tarnished by um, terrible family tragedy. His brother, John Wilkes Booth, of course, assassinated Lincoln. So, um, uh, but um, I think a, a, it's not a well-known portrait as it ought to be. I think it's one of Sargent's great masterpieces. And on the right, the another flamboyant um, uh, Spanish dancer, Carmen Chita, who was all the rage in New York in 1890, and Sargent asked to paint her. It's said that um, all the women got so carried away that they threw their jewels at his at her feet, and Sergeant had to buy them back. And that's the story, I don't know. Anyway, um, he persuaded her to sit to him, and this was bought by the French um, at the time, so it was the first Sergeant to enter a French public collection. And this is just showing you en passant, the Sergeant um, Hall in the upper staircase hall in the Boston Public Library, devoted to the triumph of religion, he called it, which takes you from the pagans through the Hebrew and Christian uh, subjects. I, mean, I think they're wonderful. And he had to retrain himself entirely as a muralist, uh, because of course, painting flat, <coughs> decorative pictures required quite different skills. And he goes back to school, and he constructs um, models, quarter-sized models of these spaces in order to test things out, he does drawings for practically every figure, charcoal drawings, studies for the composition. It's an elaborate program. He does all the architectural enrichments. It's his sort of Sistine Chapel. And it's been restored recently and relit. And it's, uh, I think, terrific um, uh, uh, work of art. Then he went on to do the murals in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. And there's the pagan end with the, um, the Assyrians and the, the Assyrians and the, um, the Egyptians and the poor uh, Jews sort of um, being beaten up by, um, uh, and then the freeze of prophets, great Hebraic <coughs> prophets for their Moses in, in relief. Uh, in England, it's um, uh, one of his first successes as a portraitist is this great picture of Ellen Terry as Lady Macbeth, Ellen Terry, with um, her and Henry Irving formed a great partnership. They dominated the London theatre with their Shakespearean, elaborate Shakespearean productions. And um, uh, Sergeant um, 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 was mesmerized by, he says it was her red hair, Ellen Terry's red hair, and also this dress designed by a friend of his, which has real beetle wings. The dress survives. Um, and uh, I think the whole ensemble of this actress, and he presents her in character. Um, uh, uh, originally, I think he probably thought of a more theatrical, this is her coming out of the, um, uh, out of the castle to greet Douglas, um, uh, whom they're going to murder. Um, and, um, here, in the finished picture, it took a single, more static composition, uh, and she's about to put the crown on her head, which, of course, she will never wear. Um, a sort of great moment of drama. Um, and this was 1889, and it was bought by Henry Irving for the beefsteak room in um, the Drury Lane Theatre. And um, just on that subject, um, uh, this wonderful, I'm going to say a little bit about frames, because I saw a wonderful frame uh, expert. People forget about frames, um, but it's absolutely part and parcel of, of an artist's um, uh, uh, routine, if you like. Well, how are you going to frame it? And Sergeant cared a lot about his frames um, and took a lot of trouble with them. So here in this one, an extraordinary, we don't know who the maker was, um, possibly uh, and Mrs. Comey's car designed the, the dress, may have had something to do. It's a sort of elaborate um, uh, Celtic ornate design for this uh, picture, one off. Um, but, um, and we saw earlier Madame Pyron, this was rather exciting. This, in the volume nine, this is a bit another uh, commercial, uh, <laughs> that there's uh, 
two tape conservators have written about Sargent's methods and materials, which I think, because people, you artists are always saying to me, well, well, what did he use? What kind of brushes did he use? What were his paints? Um, um, you know, how, how, did he do, how did he work, etc. Well, I hope that will answer some of them. And then another um, art historian has written a brilliant thing on the frames and really got down, you know, to studying the backs of frames and getting frame makers. And we know that this frame, which is a marvelous salon style frame, was designed by a Parisian called Hubert. So, and then you can begin to see other Hubert. Um, and um, the essay takes you through all the different um, phases of Sargent's career when he's using different frame makers as time goes on. And of course, people in America, people in France, people in England. Uh, and there's Mrs. Inches, uh, and wonderful 1887. And it's a lovely story about this. Is, um, uh, there's a little exhibition on at the MFA. I, I, I have, and my, yeah, my wife have given a whole lot of materials to the MFA to found a Sergeant Archive. But one of the interesting things is that there's a correspondence with um, uh, Mr. Clark, who organized an exhibition at the Grand Central Art Galleries, and Sergeant is saying, advising that Mr. Clark as to what he thinks should be borrowed. He said, for goodness sake, don't ask for Mrs. Hughes. She's still asking me, this is 40 years later, to come and alter her nose. Um, <laughs> So, uh, anyway, um, and that's a sort of um, a French, uh, an authentic 18th century French frame, whereas the one on the right, Senator Lodge, which is here in uh, the Portrait Gallery, Smithsonian Portrait Gallery, is a Stanford White. Stanford White was a dear friend of Sargent's and got him lots of commissions, uh, quite apart from the Boston Library, which was Stanford White's doing. Um, so this is a Stanford White frame, and a few more frames. Um, I'm going to have to just consult my notes for a minute. Um, those of you who are interested in frames, this is, um, oh yes, uh, uh, Richmond. This is a, a, a Colin Maratta frame, which he often used, the one on the left. And on the right is a Louis XIV revival frame, elaborate for the Atchison sisters. Sorry, I can't show you the whole thing. 1893, 1887 is when Sartre makes his mark in America. 1893 is the big moment in um, England. He um, exhibits these two pictures: one of the Royal Academy Lady Agnew and Mrs. Hugh Hammersley, the wife of a banker. She was the wife of a, a Scottish baronet. Uh, um, uh, in the new gallery, and it was particularly Mrs. Lady Agnew that just blew people away, blew everything else off the wall. It was so alive, um, and it was as if Sargent had let daylight into the Royal Academy. Um, the portraits generally then tended to have dark backgrounds, and he seats her in this bergere French chair, but off center, and with this great sash, and of course Sargent loves these great acres of white. Uh, when you come up close, it looks like a snowfield. It looks like a glacier. Um, I mean, it's just astonishing. And the number of tones within that white um, is astonishing. And yet, also, she's a complex. You feel she could come out of that chair like a tigress. She's a dangerous woman. She's beautiful and intense. And it's that reading of modern psychology. What I always feel with Sargent is this dialogue when he's really involved, uh, that he's in, it's not a passive, they're not passive, his sitters, they're active. It's an active um, uh, interchange that's going on. That's, I think, what makes him so exciting, makes his best portraits really live, is this sense of a dialogue going on and then we replace Sargent in behind the easel looking at these intense uh, intensely conceived and presented uh, people of course I mean he chooses um, you know the French uh, of course it's an elegant surroundings he's painting um, uh, these are people of high society um, Mrs. Hammersley 
just poised on the edge, and of course he's got that steep perspective. He's playing with perspective there. Um, and the, he's got the perspective this way, and then he's got the, 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 um, the sofa kind of at another acute angle, and he's got her just poised there. Somebody said, oh yes, she's just sat down for that on that sofa for one second, and in that second, Sargent has painted her. And that's a sort of, in the midst of active life, these are people alive, they're in real <laughs> surroundings, they're full of light, uh, full of color, uh, and it's the vitality that Sargent puts across. Of course, they're all staged. I mean, Sargent, they're all, there's a last, long, large element of theater about uh, Sargent, the performance. And of course, some of the great pictures like Lord Ribblesdale, the master of the Queen's Buckhounds, um, uh, with his little hat, and those extraordinary uh, bridges. I think the folds in those bridges are uh, quite extraordinary. And the uh, outline of the silhouette of that of the great coat he was wearing behind. Uh, people said that uh, when he was when it was exhibited in in Paris, all the People used to rush behind saying, Look, my lord diable. <laughs> Devilish, my lord. And one of his great in the Met, the, um, the Wild Wyndham girls, there's been a book about them called The Wild Wyndham's, a recent biography, part of the Souls group, a group of high minded, um, aesthetic, um, uh, aristocratic ladies, uh, grouped in this stupendous space all dripping in white, and yet, and then Sargent creates this dark mise-en-scene, these great dark spaces behind, the portrait of their mother, Lubai Watts, looming out of the darkness, um, a sort of study. I mean, that's just, if you go up to that, it's just so dazzling, the, the painting of the, those satin uh, dresses and then these magnolias. It seems to be shaped. Probably, is it me? <laughs> and then some other, of course, more personal pictures like Coventry Patmore. Somebody said this was like, um, it reminded them of a southern planter about to thrash his slaves. And, and um, it does have a very fierce, great poet. Um, and then the epitome of the um, decadent, beautiful young East Thief. Um, Graham Robertson, a very distinguished actor, writer, illustrator, collector, great collector of William Blake's works, um, with his great, uh, and Sargent's witty too. I mean, he has this sheet like, he had to take all his clothes off and wrap that coat so that this pencil um, thin uh, silhouette could be created. And of course, he's much longer. I mean, Sargent's elongated him. And that's sort of love manner is dark. He's elongated him and um, posed him against um, um, uh, its um, Japanese um, lacquer screen behind him. And then he, in the bottom, he's popped in this great big fluffy um, 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 poodle, uh, who, which took, called Mouton, took an instant delight, just like the artist, who used to remark, well, now Mouton's bitten me, we can get on with the city. <laughs> And um, of course, sometimes with friends and you know, paint them as here, Mrs. Batten, rather a fast lady, um, but a great singer, and he shows her in full voice, absolutely, sort of um, in ecstasy, and she gives voice to um, some aria. And Ada Rahan, um, the another great American actress, this was restored have just before the exhibition and was really, it's in the Met, it's now on the walls of the Met, I'm glad to say, because it's stupendous. Um, this opulent um, actress um, uh, posed with that ostrich fan before a great tapestry, a sort of 17th century tapestry of, of riders um, standing on an over song rug. Um, and, uh, I think she was such a sort of splendid creature uh, and so vivid and alive. 
And of course, Sargent, Sargent didn't like painting himself. Um, a very reserved man, very difficult to know what he was thinking or feeling. You feel it's all the passion, all the energy, all the sensuality goes into the art. Uh, I don't think he liked the searchlight on himself. And the, the three self-portraits he did were all done as commissions. This was for the self-portraits in the Uffizi Gallery. Uh, and his great friend, Henry James, painted for his 70th birthday one of Sargent's great portraits of this enigmatic, brilliant novelist, that great delicate head of the light. I think it's absolutely in his hand in his waistcoat, one of his great portraits. Um, goodness, I, am I, should I stop? Um, I'll I'm, I'm, I, I just show you a few more slides. Um, I'm sure I've seen. Um, of course, um, Sergeant gives up portraiture suddenly, asks me to paint your gates, your doors, your windows, which I would dearly love to do, but not the human face. And so in 1907, he shuts up shop to the horror society. But Mr. Sergeant, you've always painted us. No, I can't paint you, but I'll draw you. And so that's where the charcoal portraits, these vivid pictures in charcoal, he called them mug shots. He could do them in a single city. And at his best, absolutely as vital and vibrant as the oil portraits. This is uh, William Butler Yeats, the Irish poet, uh, the epitome of the poet, his great friend, um, uh, um, um, Ethel Spy, the composer, um, a great feminist, um, and she's singing, uh, and she's at the piano. Um, and uh, she's getting a revival. Her opera, The Wreckers, has been put on, so she's, if she's coming back. Her, her nephew said, oh, it's Aunt Ethel um, uh, on her bicycle catching flies. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the studio where Sergeant operated. You can see some of the Berger chairs. Um, you can see it ready for it up there, top right, uh, uh, obviously it would be an easel and a, uh, he's about to do a charcoal portrait. Uh, some of the other the screens of great tapestry. Here's one of the stereoscopic uh, viewing things. It's very probably uh, that's the great studio window. This is 31 Tite Street in Chelsea, London. And um, uh, the um, very interesting, the, um, the uh, studio practice, this is a, a painting box that's recently come to light uh, that belonged to Sargent and was given to a friend um, and it's um, been analysed, all the 36 tubes of oil paint um, and I can tell you that the pigments include earth pigments, ivory blacks, neutral grey, two lead whites, four reds of a million, two shades of rose madder, chrome orange, one chrome yellow, one chrome lemon, Indian yellow, etc. So um, all this is going into volume now. <laughs> and and here, is, here are some palettes that go with it. They're quite, they've analyzed the paint of, all, of surviving palettes. So there's a lot of new research as well as drawing in all the existing research that's been done, that's a folding palette. And I'm just going to end with a few, because of course the reason Sergeant really gives up portrait painting is partly because of the sheer burden of it all. As he said, it was the anxious relatives hanging on his brush. <laughs> Could you just alter the mouth a little, all that um, um, hassle? Um, and he wanted to paint landscapes and uh, he wanted to finish the murals which had been, he hadn't really made as much progress. So increasingly from 1907 he's exhibiting his oils, he's selling his oils and his watercolours and two great blocks of watercolours are bought, one in 1909 by Brooklyn, another set by the Boston in 1912 and just recently Last year, there was a great exhibition of the work, putting these two collections together, which went to Brooklyn and Boston. It was really a, a terrific show. This is the De Glens at the Villa Torre, uh, uh, at the Villa Torlonia in Frascati, 
wonderful picture of Jane Duplan painting away with this great um, sweep of um, the fountain going uh, round behind her. And so I'm just going to another, this is the Torrey Galley with two artist friends each painting each other and one of the, the wife of one of them wrapped in a cashmere shawl. This is the Torrey Galley in Florence. Again, this wonderful feeling for light. Um, Sergeant used to go to the Alps, first of all, then to Venice, and then he'd go somewhere in southern Europe. And here he is in Venice, love Venice. This is the Glens. Wilf at this time is painting. Isn't it bold the way that um, great sweep of the, uh, uh, of the ropes across? This is Sergeant's gondola. He often, the artists come here in the form of his prow of his boat. And what a dazzling picture of uh, an intertwinkle of his friends all lounging out um, on an alpine hillside. Uh, 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 Peter Harrison on the right is another of those leggy people Sergeant loved to paint, like Elio and, and Robert Louis Stevenson, <coughs> talented painter. And um, uh, Jinx Harrison is resting his head in the lap of uh, one of the women. In, in fact, it's quite difficult to work out how many people are in there. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is Sergeant, really, I think, so modern. You know, he's flattened the space. It's all about pattern, texture, paint, the paint itself and what he can do with it. And he crops things, he does all sorts of things with perspective, and you go up close to that and it just becomes an abstract jumble, a sort of expressionist, what have you. And you wonder, how could he paint that and yet know that if you step back it was all going to fall into... Um, and there he is in the Alps, uh, somebody said, looking like a, a, um, a chicken emerging from an egg. <laughs> painting with some friends up there. Oh yes, this is another. Well, this was the Saint-Plan Pass. And there on the left here is um, uh, my father on the right with his two brothers. And my father, post-war, took us all to Switzerland, which after ration books and austerities in Britain was like a land of milk and honey. Uh, I was eight. And that's me and my brothers on the same wall. We stayed in the same hotel on top of the Sunfall Pass. Oh, sorry, that's a bit <laughs> personal. And then, of course, he paints his nieces and their friends. This is Rosemary and Wren, whom you saw in that double portrait, dressed as odalisks in Turkish costumes that Sardin had brought out, posed beside the stream in Portu in the Val d'Aosta on the Italian side of the Alps. Absolutely dreamy uh, um, picture in which the figures seem to merge into the landscape. You know, um, and here are some of those dreamy watercolors. This is Rosemary again with uh, Dorothy Barnard, one of the girls in the Carnation in Italy Rose, and that's Rosemary again. These are both in Boston. Uh, Rosemary, yes, tragic character, Sargent's favorite Alpine model, um, a, a beautiful uh, woman, a very selfless, somebody who thought more of other people than herself. She marries a brilliant French art historian, Robert Andre Michel. He's killed in 1914 uh, in the opening offensives of the First War, and she is killed in, uh, when Saint-Gervais is shelled by long range German shells and it brings down the roof and 90 people are killed including her. They're buried out at um, outside Soissons, a little up on the hillside there, looked after by the commune, this tomb, and I was there in October um, last year on the very day that Robert fell with the mayor and the veterans and we all sang the Marseillaise. And anyway, I'm very... Now there's a lovely book being published about them called Sargent's Muse by Dan Willeman and Karen Corsano. And of course, Sargent's world, in a way, comes to an end with the First War, this great picture of Gast, great war requiem 
of these men blinded by, by the mustard gas walking uh, in line towards a dressing station against this ravishing evening sky, um, a sort of vision of hell already, um, and uh, was to, intended to be the centerpiece of a great hall of remembrance, um, talk, uh, uh, epitomizing the sacrifice and heroism of war. It was never built, but Gast remains one of Sargent's great masterpieces. Um, and uh, I, I've come to the end here, Sergeant 1924. He dies a year later on the eve of coming back to America to install the very last of the murals in the, in the Boston um, Museum of Fine Arts. Um, he dies with Voltaire's Lettre Philosophique on his chest. And he's buried in Brookwood outside London in Surrey. Um, and I've gone on for far too long. Thank you very much. We've got uh, a few questions here, and uh, Richard Norman uh, mentioned that he would um, answer a few of them. And, uh, and I, I just have to say, I felt uh, that uh, it was uh, just extraordinary how Sargent just came to life in that lecture, uh, very much the same way that Sargent brings his subjects to life. So it was really uh, exhilarating. Uh, so, we've got, um, Donna asks, uh, uh, are the letters to Monet, Monet coming to the D.C. area soon? Um, well, they're on show at the minute, this small exhibition welcoming the gift of Warren Adelson, who's in fact, the, who supported the Catalog Resume. Um, he owned the Monet letters, and they're now part of the Sergeant Archive. They've still got to be catalogued, so they're in Boston. Um, and there is this little exhibition with a number of them on show um, at this moment in the MFA. Uh, they have all been published in volume six. Be <laughs> <laughs> sure to get that one. <laughs> okay, and Anne asks, how much was Sargent influenced by Dugas and Michelangelo since he was a portrait artist versus a landscape artist? Uh, good point. Um, uh, yes, uh, Degas was rather rude about Sargent, um, though he did have his name in one of the Degas notebooks, Sargent's name, and Sargent exhibited with him at the Gallery Georges Petit. And I think Sargent was an admirer of Degas, you know, like the Padelou Orchestra seems to me to come out of Degas. Um, Michelangelo is more difficult, but um, as a muralist, I think. Um, you do get uh, the Sergeant, some of his life, um, there's some wonderful watercolors where he's, um, I think, influenced in the way he poses the figure by Michelangelo. Nobody could not be, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's a sort of, um, uh, isn't it, Michelangelo is a sort of rock, um, and particularly, uh, sculpt and sometimes he does do some sculpture too. Um, you, you forget that there are, you know, within the, Boston uh, Public Library scheme are a number of reliefs, um, and uh, he did do one or two independent um, sculptures of a crucifixion, and there's one in Turkey and some of the reliefs. But, so he was, in that way, you know, a Renaissance man. And I would imagine if you're painting the ceiling, you can't call it the But I know that. But I'm sure you could do an essay on something like that. Particularly Main uh, influences and inspiration uh, when it comes to the Italians, the Venetians, and that. Yes, is, yes. That I mean, he's very knowledgeable about art history. And one of the things I think I wanted to, get, to do in the exhibition of Sargent's um, portraits and friends was to bring out the fact that he's not just a kind of brilliant painter, but that he's a deeply cultured man. And people relied on him for advice. I mean, he gave advice to um, museums on which pictures they should acquire. And if, you know, there are several instances where people would either seek his advice or he would give his advice about potential acquisitions. So he was looked on as somebody who knew about the old masters. And it's, it would be pretty rare, like, I mean, uh, it, for last question, um, Goya, 
Cintoretto, um, Titian, uh, El Greco. Uh, those are the kind of people that you know who was deeply influenced by. And we have another question here. Melody asks, in reference to the uh, Boyd sisters that are painting at the MFA, yes. it was said that uh, the daughters have been abused and portrayed to not look at the viewer. Uh, do you know if there's any truth to this? Um, I like them. Somebody said to me once, oh yes, the white girls, they've just murdered the nanny. <laughs> <laughs> they just look if they could pop her into one of those large girls. <laughs> and they're pretty dysfunctional. I mean, the only one who seems natural is the little girl, you know, in the foreground playing with her doll. The one in facing you looks as if she's something and there are two moody, moody teenagers half hidden in the uh, critic described it as the as the game of four corners and a void and because of, you know the center of the picture I mean it's a group it's a disaster but of course it's one of the great monsters because of the, the atmosphere of what it creates in these on set and it's a picture that people have endlessly fantasized about what he means, and you know, it's, I'm sure there will all be interpretations of it, and as in all great works of art, they're open-ended. You know, there's no end to what you could um, say about that picture. And of course, it's a, also a hymn to, to Velasquez, you know, I mean, it's his last name, he has comparisons to be made, but um, it's the mystery of space. And uh, do you think that was a commission portrait or was that yes. something? Yes. Uh, Edward Boyd was a, uh, a painter and I think because he was a painter he would understand what Sartre was doing. I mean a normal person would have been outraged. You know I wanted a picture of my four girls and what have you given me? But, uh, and Sartre knew he owned Boyd because Boyd organized the 1909 and 1912 exhibitions which were joint Boyd Sartre watercolor exhibitions. And Sargent says, I owe Boyd. He doesn't want to lend them because he says it's so much hassle getting all these watercolors together. You have to pay the customers duties. You have to get them framed. And also, if I send them over, every institution is going to ask me uh, to lend my watercolors, and I don't want to do it. So he pays really hard to get. But at the end of the day, I think his feeling of his debt and he says then, well, I would be prepared to sell to an institution, but not to private individuals. He's very conscious that he wants, if he's going to sell these watercolors, he wants it to be <coughs> where they're going to be seen and where they're going to be in the public domain. And Brooklyn puts in a bid for uh, the whole lot. And at the 11th hour, Boston, said, well, you can't do this. We are new. You're our man, Mr. Sargent. You can't go off to Brooklyn. But it don't come up with a reasonable thing. But they, they, they say, well, it, the next time, it's our lot. And so he's conscious between 1909 and 1912 that he's painting for an institution. And those watercolors are much more formulated. They're taken to a higher degree of finish and they're more presentation watercolors, whereas the Brooklyn got the simply a selection of what Sartre already had in hand. So it's quite interesting. Sartre, I think he's quite sort of strategic, but initially he doesn't want to, but he loves the idea of these institutions owning them rather than private individuals. And this might relate to that also with the next question. Uh, uh, we can't avoid Madame Boutreau. Uh, Anne asks, uh, Madame X, uh, wrote his career during his lifetime, did he ever experience the success of Madame X? Yes. Um, uh, and actually, a, well, in the, the archive exhibition at the minute, there's a, 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 a very interesting note. Um, uh, uh, Sergeant's writing to another woman, Madame Alouard, she was a mutual friend, and Virgin, uh, 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 Amélie uh, Gautreau adds a note saying how much she admires Sartre and what a great picture he's doing, which is 
quite contrary to the version that she was outraged by it, and, you know, once the scandal started. But um, Sargent knew it was a great masterpiece. He didn't exhibit it, it was in his studio. But once Madame Gautreaux dies in 1915, the following year, he offers it to the Metropolitan Museum. He says to the director, I think this is my greatest work. So he was conscious, even <coughs> despite the scandal, that this was a great master. Yes, indeed it is. Can you tell us a little bit about how it got made, Madam? Um, yes, it's not really. Um, if you were in the salon catalogue, you didn't want to be named. There was a convention that you said, Madam, little x, x, x. It's not one single x, it's x. It's four little X's. That, but it wasn't just Madame Gautreau. Anybody who was, I mean, of course, everybody knew who she was, so I don't know who they were thinking, but very often distinguished ladies like to feel that they were not made. And so they would put in the sound catalog, Madame X, 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 X. Uh, but little X's. And so that's, um, that's uh, but that we turned it into a Madame single big X. <laughs> so it had nothing to do with the uh, sergeant being upset with <laughs> No, 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 nothing at all. No, it was the man Gautreaux didn't want to be named, so she adopted the convention. And uh, the last uh, question, uh, uh, sergeant was a lifelong bachelor. Uh, um, this uh, fellow was asking, did he have a love? And uh, why did he never met her? Um, one's often asked that. Um, he's very different, very private man. Um, some people think he was gay. Um, uh, um, he had very close friendships with women. I think he was, I think it goes back quite deep actually. I think it goes back to mum. Um, I somehow, I think he had a fear of physical frightened. There's a very revealing, when his sister is getting married, he says he's very, he takes her off to America to cool her down and hopes that they, you know, they don't really approve of Francis Ormond, this tearaway Swiss tycoon. So, um, he says about this that, you know, he says I'm so worried for her because, you know, passion can so easily turn to hate. And you feel in that that it's almost about himself you know, the fear of, I mean, he was briefly said to have been engaged to Louise Burkhardt, who was the subject of that lovely picture of the lady with the rose in the Metropolitan, a wonderful sort of Velasquez inspired portrait. But I think that was just the ambitious mother engineering it, and Sergeant <laughs> scuttled for safety um, you know, as soon as he could. So, um, and there are some very, you might say, soft porn drawings of male nudes, um, you know, that are quite erotic. Um, but equally, there are some stunning nude pictures of women. So, um, uh, yes, uh, I think, I mean, he may have had brief affairs with Venetian gondolera or, or Arab boys or, you know, uh, um, but there's no sign of any meat long term um, love relationship um, and um, I think all of it went into his art but of course he was an art he was you know very robust health so he presumably had all sexual act, you know desires but maybe he sublimated them all um, but uh, so that's one of the it's, um, you know these very reticent private people you know, he didn't like talking about his deeper feelings anyway. You know, it's very difficult to, you know, what's he really feeling? It comes through sometimes, but almost sort of parenthetically rather than directly. Um, so, um, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs>